so let me introduce our fabulous panelists here today, because um, I wanted to be able to just jump straight into the conversation. Um, so no introduction necessary, but I'm going to introduce Jay Smooth, um, veteran hip hop DJ, cultural commentator, video blogger at illdoctrine.com. Um, Jay started his career at WBAI radio where he founded the New York's longest running hip hop radio station, the Underground Railroad, right? Um, introduced artists like Wu-Tang Clan, Naughty by Nature, um, Gene Gray, and Natural Elements. Um, Chuck D has called him the best hip hop conversationalist, right? Um, Jay's best known for his social commentary on illdoctrine.com, the video series, and he mixes us uh, humor and incisive analysis, which has garnered millions of views on NPR, CNN, MSNBC, and all the likes, right? Um, we have Scott Laguerre here. Over the past 18 years, Scott Laguerre has played key roles in the ownership and operation of audio recording facilities, independent record labels, media schools, commercial music production companies. Um, he's done, he's engineered Grammy nominated albums, produced critically acclaimed independent projects and lectured nationally at university classrooms across the nation. Woo, yeah. And then we have Chuck Herms. Um, he is the chief executive officer and co-founder of Clockwork. We had Nancy here earlier from that, an interactive uh, design and technology agency based in Minneapolis. Um, before that, though, he worked nights at Paisley Park as a receptionist. Is, is that true? Wow. And then he worked, he worked his way up. You must have answered those. Right. You must have answered those phones really well. You worked your way up all, all the way to the art department um, at Paisley Parks. Um, and you inspired Prince's early exploration of the internet and online uh, audience engagement. And also co-founder of Bitstream Underground. Um, which is an internet and web development services company. And then we all know our local gem, Miss Robin Robinson. <laughs> Woo! Um, we all know Robin, well-known personality here in the Twin Cities for more than 20 years, award-winning pioneer in Minnesota broadcasting and state politics. Um, she was the first black prime time news anchor in Minneapolis. She also is an international jewelry designer and currently works as the arts and culture director at the Airport Foundation MSP. So let's jump into this conversation. We're here to talk about artists and businesses working together collaboratively, right? The good, the bad, the ugly. Um, so let's go ahead and dig into that. So what's one of the things you guys wish artists knew about working well with businesses or vice versa, um, based on your experiences. You wanna start? Go ahead. They don't understand us. <laughs> Who? The artist the doesn't business, understand? The businesses. The, the okay. businesses don't understand the artist. And I think we've had a lot of great conversations already today about changing language and helping to organize the language that we use so it's more impactful to bridge between the artist and the business community. But knowing that, that knowing that someone has a hard time understanding, and it was, I think, the last panel on collaboration, you're not just getting paid for an hour of your time when you're rewarded as an artist. There is thought, there is growth, there is mm. development, there is years of pain in human life uh, that, that helps you do what you do. And that's often missed by business, who is counting hours and counting clocks and all of those sorts of things. And so knowing that off the bat, that you, you're going to have to find a middle ground before you jump into hard negotiation, I think would be really helpful. I, I think that's very true. I, I, I have been on both sides, and so it's kind of interesting to, mm -hmm. to watch from both sides and then have to work from both sides. Uh, I think that uh, most young artists today know that uh, they have to be both an artist and a business person. Right. I think there are some still in my generation that haven't quite caught on that the 80s died and you don't have sponsors. <laughs> you know, there's no, no such thing as sponsors anymore. If it's a corporate sponsor, I think that many artists don't realize that major corporations work out of fear. Fear of losing numbers, fear of losing revenue. So everything they do has legal rules 
and regulations for everything. And I think when, when everybody gets the contract for the commission, it's exciting. Mm. It's exciting for both sides. But then corporations start looking at everything legally. And I think that slows down a lot of the, the goodwill between artists and corporations. And also that many corporations don't understand that artists don't exist on clouds and that they need to eat. And they have to mm. pay up front for the artists to get started yep. because they can't come out of their own pocket. And yep. that has been a big source of conversation with the corporations I've been working with lately. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, a lot of my experience is more in the nonprofit sector. Um, I come from nonprofit, left wing fringe activist radio background at WBAI. Um, and I think lessons on both sides of that arena are I think the, the other side of the coin, if you're not working with a corporate entity, is if you're a for profit enterprise, you have this tangible goal of we need to get this money. If you're a nonprofit, you'll often have a prime directive that's more noble, but also more abstract. And it makes it easier to keep deliberating and having meetings forever and ever and never <laughs> commit to ideas. Yeah. And as a creative person, you want to get what you need to make these things. Right. And so I think when you're on that end of things, it's important to understand that if you have, if in the next six months, you try out five ideas, four of them don't work, and you learn from them, and then the fifth one works, that's gonna be more for uh, your work than if you have six months of meetings and don't do any of the five plans. Um, so that's, you know, that's, that's something as the creative person that you can always try to pull people towards. And I think if you're a creative person who does a lot of community, nonprofit, uh, for the love sorts of things, when you reach a point that you are trying to get paid for your work, you have to learn how to know your worth and uh, ask for it um, and fight, not just to get the money that you deserve, but to have the resources and the commitment and the creative freedom to make what you are trying to make and bring your vision to life, which is it's easy not to have that instinct and to feel like it's selfish or narcissistic when you come from, we're doing this for the people, so we're just gonna handle whatever resources we have. And, it's gonna be easier working with for-profit people a lot of time for them to understand, well, okay, yeah, we're gonna pay for quality. And I think you also have to know yourself and know like, for my public speaking, I've gotten somebody to do those things for me because I'm just, I'm never gonna ask for the amount that I should be asking for coming from this background. So finding someone that can do that for you and, and fight that fight, you know, and that's something that there's been, you know, since Prince passed, there's been so many insight from people that work with him, including a lot of unlikely sources. And one of my favorites was uh, the creator of the show. I think the show is named New Girl. That's the show he was yeah. on, right? Liz, mm -hmm. Liz Merriweather. And she talked about how what she learned the most from working with him is that, uh, you know, we have a vision of creative geniuses as just having this magical power to bring art to life. But working with Prince, she saw that you know, lots of people can have a vision, but what makes you a genius in the real world is that tenacity to fight for your vision and fight past this world of human beings and phone calls and <laughs> lawyers and accountants and do everything you need to do to make this vision in your mind real in the world. So that's, can I, can that's, I take you back on that real quick? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, one of my favorite Prince stories on that tip is that Prince was an amazing businessman who was very astute, but he was also very street. Yeah. And he didn't play when it came to his money. <laughs> so we, there was a, uh, an event, uh, I'm not going to say the name, but there was an event, and everybody was really questioning whether or not this event could pay everyone. And it got back to Paisley Park. Uh, Prince told them he would not set foot on stage till he got paid. He did not want a check, he wanted cash. And <laughs> they said, well, how are we going to get this to him? And he said, don't care, got to be here. It was delivered in a pizza box. Mm -hmm. uh, but as soon as he opened the lid and he saw what he had to, the show went on. Mm -hmm. So, you know, sometimes you've got to really work in a very business way that's very professional. But you always have to keep that street in mind in order to get yourself paid. Mm -hmm. I, I think what's exciting, though, starting out in this conversation, and there's 30 things that have come up that we could all pigtail off of, is that partly because companies are scared today, there's more competition in every single sector of the global economy than there ever has been. Because of that, you are deeply in demand as creative art makers and entrepreneurs. And we often feel that we are unempowered, right? I mean, that's been a part of the theme today. We often feel that, that we aren't rewarded and we aren't needed. 
you really are because your work, your authenticity can push a company into the marketplace, can help launch a new product, can really anchor another piece of art or media that's been made. So know that there is actually a lot of potential for this. Yes, it's, it's, it's a choppy water to navigate, but the deals that happen in this realm between art and business aren't just Chance the Rapper now repping H&M. It can be much smaller, things like Doomtree partnering with Surly and, and doing a custom beer. So there really are levels of entry for probably everyone in this room for really unique and special collaborations. So when we're talking about entry, what are some, um, from an artist's perspective, what are some things that you should walk into in thinking about partnering um, with the business? Like what, um, like I often think it's important that you and the organization you're partnering with or whatever the initiative you're partnering with has some type of shared values around the work. Um, what are some other things that you think as an entry point to kind of mitigate some of those challenges that might come down later that artists should walk into or businesses um, should have in mind um, when getting ready to partner? Not everybody has instant access to uh, advertisers or people and corporations that can get them into Entryway. Some of the best ways are it to do Business is like coming to Giant Steps and networking. Uh, you never know who's going to be at some of these events. But networking is, is really essential, and especially for a big corporation like the airport. Uh, when we started the program, one of the first things we started was to create one of the first film screening rooms in a U.S. airport. Now, the challenge itself is to try to get people to understand that, but we wanted to give back to the community and build on uh, trying to educate people about Minnesota and the region. So, you know, the, the whole idea was twofold. It's like we, we really want to attract people here. We want to make people who are from here really see that we support mm -hmm. uh, our, our arts community. One of the least represented uh, genres is, uh, of film is short film. Hmm. And it's perfect for an airport because people are trying to catch flights. So what we did was partner with the Film Society of Minneapolis-St. Paul and TPT. TPT has a whole cadre of Minnesota Originals and Lower Town oh, yeah. Lines. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Film Society, we just keep going to them. And then we posted on our site that we're looking for short films. And so if you network with groups like that, it helps you get into a pool of opportunities that you can get through an organization to reach a larger body of people to, to, to show your work. So networking, mm -hmm. you know, looking up, if you're a filmmaker, do you know everything that's going on in this film community? Are you part of the IFP? Are you part of Minnesota Film and TV? Uh, are you going to Twin Cities Black Film Festival? Are you going to the Disabilities Reel? Are, you know, are you paying attention to who's going to those things, who's being represented, who the organizations are, and are you getting your name out there and talking and telling people what you have so that way they can network you to the right person to get your work exposed? Yeah, on that topic of networking, um, I'm a founding board member of the Minnesota Music Coalition, which is a nonprofit organization that supports Minnesota's independent musicians and uh, a goal is to make Minnesota a great place, the best state in the country for, for independent musicians to live and work. And that's an organization, there are many of these organizations that help artists um, network with business people. And also we teach people about getting grants. So we live in Minnesota that has the Legacy Fund and there's a lot of grant money out there. And one of the ideas is to help um, individuals uh, learn how to uh, discover grants, fill out the paperwork, and then eventually hopefully get the grant money, but get grants that they can partner with businesses in order to create new opportunities for the artists. Mm -hmm. So it's much easier to um, walk in the doors of a Target Corp if you have some grant money that can help you with your idea and then go get the support of the organization or the, the business to um, see it through. Let's talk about a time, like let's talk about some of the collaborations that you guys have been part of, right? Um, think, of, can you talk to us about either your best experience with the business artist 
um, and I know they're out there. Of your best experience with the business artist collaboration or some of those um, moments where they were a little bit more challenging um, in working with a, a business or if you were a business working with an artist. Sometimes the artists are the challenge too, you know. <laughs> well, let's be honest. You know, sometimes people start thinking outside the realm of what you were possibly pick, you know, trying to put together. Uh, so I really don't like to talk too much about the negatives because, you know, sometimes bridges are burned and you hate for that to happen. But really some of the positive things that, you know, with being at the airport now and arts at MSP is three years old and uh, we try really hard to make it known that we want to be a part of the community, that we are the backdoor neighbor for everybody in the southeast part of the metro. And so uh, the opportunity came up with the Mall of America trying to extend its reach from the southeast down to the North Loop mm -hmm. uh, and try to reach those consumers and be a part of Minnesota Fashion Week and all that. And uh, I, I thought of it and I said, well, one of the best ways that we can do that and show that we want to reach the entire community is to try to collaborate with partners outside. And so we wound up uh, collaborating with uh, Metro Transit and the Hennepin Theater Trust and um, some local uh, modeling agencies and choreographers. And uh, we put together uh, an opportunity to show people that crea creatives and the art world and fashion all need transit and depend on transit in a very big way. And so we did a fashion show on the go hmm. from the Mall of America. They got on light rail on the blue line. We did a hashtag campaign for it. We, we prepped with you know a lot of organizations to let them know to get their cameras down there. And so we did a fashion show on the train, uh, stopping at different intervals. So they get off at the, uh, the airport. We have one of the largest train platforms in the city. And so we had a DJ and artwork, and when they stepped off, people were stunned to see models step off, do a fashion show that was timed to the, the train stops. <laughs> and so as soon as the next train came, they were gone, boom, and they were heading down. And so you know, we did you know, uh, 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 editorial shots on the train, on the platforms. Uh, we'd get off, and the final stop was in front of the Bob Dylan mural that was done by Eduardo Cobra and his team. And so uh, it got a lot of play, and we were really excited because it gave us an opportunity to really work within the community and to do something that made it a destination for mm. people. There were people that were tweeting ahead. It's like, we're stopping here. Are you stopping here? It's like, yes. And so they'd stop, and they'd get their cameras out. And it was, it was really wonderful. And it was, it, was, it was playful. It was fun. But it also gave the message that you know, as people are trying to reach out to different, uh, different parts of the city, that the airport is the bridge for arts everywhere, not mm. just for the people who are flying through, but we're a bridge for the arts community. We are the gateway to making things happen in this community, whether it's North Loop or Southeast Loop. And uh, you know, those are really positive experiences when you're working with not just major corporations and nonprofits, but really people that are grassroots right. in the community too. Jay, what about you? What unlikely collaborations have you either been a part of or seen um, between artists and businesses that really kind of? Um, I can't really think of any particular examples. I'm usually, if I have a partnership, it'll either be with some sort of activist organization and I'll help them make media that uh, furthers their work, or it'll be some sort of media entity like I was making videos for the Fusion Network or Current TV or XXL. Um, so I haven't, I haven't had the experience of going directly to some sort of brand or corporate entity and trying to have a partnership there. Um, I will say, I mean, as she said, networking is everything. Again, another less uh, toxic sounding word for that is community, really. And whatever you have a passion for, I mean, as a hip hopper, we've been around long enough that whatever corporation or media group you're talking to, there are heads in there. Like you, you shouldn't go in assuming that it's just some white bread plutocrat, even if it is predominantly white, um, in every organization mm -hmm. you're working with. You can, as long as you are building community and networking, you can find people in each place that are down and will know what's real and try to support it mm -hmm. and want to share the wealth. And so I think it's important to seek that out and, like I was saying, articulate what you need to create something with integrity. And I've found a lot of times like I, 
I try to always stress I don't want to be on an all-male panel when I'm doing an event. And a lot of times, uh, it'll turn out the organizers genuinely just haven't considered that up until now. And they'll say, oh, well, yeah, you know, I guess we should. And then they'll change things around. So it's, it's important to voice those things and try to push forward. I would disagree with you about the word networking. Let me just say that. <laughs> to, I would tell you like I tell everybody else, networking is like sex. You can give them your number, and you don't have to take them home. Mm. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm not saying everyone becomes your best friend. <laughs> but there's people in the community you don't like either. <laughs> you all know how I am. I just say what I feel. Uh, Joby, mm. I like the, the, the fact that you said values mm -hmm. when you sort of broached that conversation. And while these types of collaborations really are more available to all of us than we probably realize, understand you're also empowered to say no. Right. And mm -hmm. there are times when you will make a decision based on values that, you know what, I don't think this is the right fit for me. I don't think this is the right fit for my, my art and my voice. And part of the, the, the networking piece can actually be, we call homework is also safe stalking, where if you think tried and true about what your values are, you can probably identify other groups, other organizations, other corporations that also have those priorities, and you can reach out to them and start that dialogue. Um, because we, again, we want our work and our art and our energy to be represented in communion with something that, that hopefully works for everybody. Yeah, I was, I was gonna say the same. I was hesitant to, just because I know if you're broke, you're broke. Right. <laughs> so sometimes you're gonna have to make right. compromises. But I've learned, I've been lucky enough to learn that if you make that choice, there's a cumulative value over the years to holding to a set of principles and building that long-term integrity that's worth it if you can. So how do people, so what should one think about like as an artist if you're trying to um, expand your, your footprint and you're trying to um, increase the business opportunities that come your way, what should one think about? Chuck. What do you that's a good question. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, you know, as, so me at this point in my life, I'm more businessman than artist. Mm -hmm. um, and thinking back, this kind of goes back to the last question too of trying to find a, a common language from artist to business person, and I've been on both sides of this, and I remember Michael Koppelman, who was up here earlier, he and I started this business bitstream right out of Paisley Park, and we were not business people at all. Mm -hmm. And we found ourselves in this office tower downtown Minneapolis, and we were dressed like we dress, and, and everybody in the office building was dressed in office wear and makeup and perfect hair. And we, uh, <laughs> we took the elevator down and said, this, we can't do this, you know? This, we, we can't do this. But we found that you know, in order to do what we really were passionate about, which this business was our art at that point, is that we had to, to learn the language and learn to communicate with different types of people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, business over the years now, over the 20 years I've been doing this, like the businessman looks more like this now, for the most part, and that right. makes it a lot easier for all of us to, to approach. But I think it's really um, taking risks and going out and talking to business people and showing up at business events and, and bringing your art and ideas and not waiting for a request for something, mm -hmm. but um, taking the chance and taking the risks. I mean, that's one of the things, Brave Souls, that was talked about earlier is like, you're not gonna get something unless you ask for it, so, so I ask. What about you, Jay, because you've grown, right? You've expanded your opportunities and obviously it looks like technology played a lot um, into that, but could you kind of speak to how could one um, increase their footprint um, to attract more business opportunities as an artist. Yeah, I mean, an important lesson that I learned working at WBAI Pacifica Radio, um, you know, it's a great institution that I'm really proud to work with, but like many lefty organizations, you know, it's dysfunctional from time to time. And <laughs> around 2001, we had a lot of turmoil going on, and um, the great reporter Amy Goodman, who is one of the people I started out working with back in 89, um, during that time, she saw that, you know, if I'm relying on this institution to give me a voice, um, that's a tenuous position for me to be in. I need to be working from land that I own. And right around that time, she extricated Democracy Now! and made it its own independent organization, still working with Pacifica, but not reliant upon them to have a voice and a connection to the world. 
And it was from watching that that I saw, you know, I, I'm in the same position. If I'm relying on this ship and it sinks, then I have no more connection uh, with these people I speak to now. And it was right after that I started first blogging at hiphopmusic.com and helped to build that hip hop blogging community and then went on to do video blogging after that um, so that I could have my space where if you resonate with what I'm doing, you can come see me here on this land that I own. And then that gives my voice value that allows me to connect with other entities who can fund and support. And I'm operating from a stronger position and it's beneficial to both of us mm. um, to be working from it that way. So that's, that's a lesson I took from Amy that I try to bring. And we obviously have so much more opportunities now with all of this technology to work from land that we own. Although, now that everything has to go through Facebook and Twitter, we're kind of renting that land again. So that's something. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's the way of looking at it. Scott, what, because you teach, um, you teach your student, students this, right? I, I try. You, so, like, what, what are some of the good points what, that you should tell them? Well, to, to carry off what you were just saying, I think what's interesting is because of the tools we have today and the opportunities that we have today, we aren't just artists. We can be artist entrepreneurs. Right. And that might be another way that you can start to bridge yourself into the business community and these types of opportunities and collaborations is you can also make yourself a business. No matter how uh, legitimized you'd like to be, but maybe you're not just a musician, you're a musician that starts a record company. Maybe you're not just a writer, but you're a writer that helps start a small periodical. And no matter how small those things might be and whether they're not, they just live in the digital realm on websites and social media, you're adding value to what you bring to the table and you're wearing multiple hats and you're showing that to anybody else who might come and get involved. And, and also, this, con this conversation isn't binary. You're not just ever an artist. You're not just ever an entrepreneur. I mean, I think one of the biggest challenges to taking giant steps is that we sort of have to be all these things all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? And we're probably all shifting and moving between you're taking a money gig, you're making an art project. You're taking a money mm -hmm. gig, you're making an art project. And that, I think that's something that we will bounce between most of our lives. Yeah. Uh, and here's a plus, is there's been lots of talk about support. I see that in my family. You know, my wife, my wife says, I need a break, I need to recharge. Okay, I'll shift into a business money mm -hmm. mode She'll go chase another business opportunity. I can take a break and go do an art project. So we can even find that within our family structures uh, to support each other too. And we, we found, I'm sorry. We found at Clockwork too that um, we hire musicians and we mm. hire artists. Um, because musicians, just to choose one, uh, they're business people whether they like it or not. Yeah. Whether they, they realize it or not. If you've been in a band, you've scheduled, you've scheduled tours, you've figured out how to record, you've figured out to sell yourself, how to sell yourself to clubs. Um, those people take that creative mindset of their, their art into business and they're fantastic on our staff. Um, I was joking with another at a conference a couple of years ago, like, we should just, that's all we should hire is guys with failed bands. Let's, you know, guys and girls, <laughs> if your band has failed, come work with us. My father was, a, um, was an alderman in Chicago, and in our home, community was everything. I mean, always, a community has your back. And I, I, I think a lot of people sometimes think that they get the job and they prove themselves in the job and the bosses are gonna see that they're just fantastic and they're just gonna move right up. Um, it doesn't happen that way anymore. And I had a conversation with one of my co-anchors once and I said, you know, are, are you gonna pick up any of these events that, you know, are happening in the, you know, I'm gonna go do this and this and this. And he goes, I don't do events. Hmm. And I said, why? And he goes, because I've learned that, you know, even if I win a Grammy or I win an Emmy, that uh, they can still fire you. And I, I yeah. said, oh, okay. Sure. And I kind of got what he was saying. He was saying, why should I put in that kind of effort if I'm just gonna be transferred someplace mm -hmm. else? But I learned that you don't get transferred someplace else so quickly if the community knows you mm -hmm. and appreciates what you're doing. And it's not just window dressing what you're doing. You right. do the things that you're committed to and the things that you really believe in in the community. And then you get community support. When we started doing the buzz at Channel 9, um, I was like this close to getting fired a c couple times because my bosses 
hated it. They did not see the value in it. They felt I was wasting their time on the air. Um, they didn't recognize half of the people that were, were on most of the time. And so, you know, I'm sitting at my desk and near in tears half the time because, you know, I took a risk. I took the big leap of faith of trying to carve something out for myself in a newsroom where I was one of the probably the only black faces, when few females at the top mm -hmm. of that, um, nobody really was interested in what I was interested mm -hmm. in covering. And so I had started by taking the assignments that nobody else would take, like going to North Minneapolis, mm -hmm. going to over Robert Street. And that's how I started building my career. But then when this opportunity came up to anchor, they didn't want me on the anchor desk full time either. So I had to carve this niche out for myself, and it was me and another producer, and we started doing the buzz, but then every day we'd come in and we'd be told how awful it was, don't do these stories anymore. What happened was I was at KFAI, and I was talking to Mark Wheat. And Mark Wheat, because I had built community and we'd see each other out in public, and he'd ask me to do something, and I'd do something for him, and he'd do something for me, he took it upon himself to go on the air and tell people, if you don't support this show, it's going to go away. And this is the only show that reflects who we are in this community, in the arts and music and theater, dance. So you need to support it. Uh, Steve Greenberg, who wrote the song Funky Town, saw my general manager in a restaurant and walked up to him and says, if you take that off the air, you're an idiot. <laughs> and then the phone calls started coming in. They were getting 30, 35, 40 phone calls a day saying save the bus. So just the opportunity to be in the community, learn the community. Before I even moved here, I would send letters to council members and to the mayor and say, hello, I'm getting ready to move to this town. I'd like to have a meeting with you so you can tell me what this town's about so I can learn. I did everything I could possibly do to fit into this community. And it paid off in the end because when I was decided to walk away from TV, the community had my back right. and I wound up here. So networking, risk taking, family backing. Mm -hmm. I mean, like you said, you know, this is the only place I've ever been where somebody has a band and their parents are dancing out front. <laughs> you know? That's the support that you need and that's the support that you count on. That's the support that's gonna take you where you need to go. But you've also got to do the work yourself too and network the hell out of this stuff. Yeah, I, I think as it relates to curricula and, and how do you teach all the things that we're doing? You teach it through attending conferences like this. I mean, it, it, it's, it's not surprising that when I engage in conversations like this, it comes back to the word community. Mm. And just looking at the music world in, in our area, when you look at the things that are successful, the things that are bubbling up and now touring the world, they're coming out of community. They're coming out of rhyme sayers. They're coming out of doom tree. They're coming out of things supported by the current you know, we often look at those most successful and especially uh, outsized talents like Prince and we think, well, that's something that I don't have. And he was a tremendous talent, but this has been discussed already today, that he also still didn't do it by himself. Mm -hmm. There were other people on stage, there were other people in the art department, there were people at the label. And even when he wrote Slave on his face, it was interesting the relationship that he had with Warner Brothers was less acrimonious than you would think. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was making a very astute business statement, not necessarily, I hate Mo Austin and the people I'm working with. Mm -hmm. um, this is the start of figuring out how to make your literal giant steps, is being able to let that guard down and being vulnerable, again, back to the ask and what we were talking about earlier today. Can you ask the person next to you for, for help, for support, for ideas? This is where it starts. Mm -hmm. This is rich, fertile, lucrative soil that, you know, not just Prince, but Husker Du and Babes in Toyland, mm -hmm. and really a lot of people who just strove to make their music known. And that what they did is they talked to everybody. The, the, the degrees of separation here are so amazing. It's less than six, it's like two. And, <laughs> you know, it, and it's not like this in any other parts of the world and in the parts of this country. That's what makes this place so remarkable. So if we're here to talk about Prince, let's talk about the honest fact that the, the fertile soil that we have here is, is really filtered by people who decided to keep their music here and make the industry come here. Mm, yeah. And people who kept their art here 
and made the museums take look at the walker, that dancers stay here and make the dance world come here. So not to be scared, you should take that information and really be proud of yourself and just really have some cojones about it and just go out there and know that you work on fertile ground to people who did the same thing that you are trying to do right now and build on it. Never be scared, because fear is the mind killer. Right, and I think, do we have, for Q&A, yeah, I was looking for that, okay. Um, let's take some questions from the audience. Where's the mic person? Are we, yeah, go ahead, do we have a mic? I think it's coming. Yeah. I have a loud voice. Go oh, for it. Yeah, <laughs> go for it. Um, I'm wondering if you guys are actively, um, the term creative placemaking, is that new field emerging that matches our business and business, and if that's what's happening now, and how to be a part of that, and how to engage in it? Arts at MSP is probably one of the, the biggest creative placemaking centers right now. And I'm really, really psyched about it. You know, it, it's, it's taken three years to try to get the word out there to people know that we are expanding programs and really trying to do more. We have a fall arts luncheon coming up with a lot of the arts nonprofits in the community. And we've reached out to over 65 to try to get them there. We're trying to do this annually. So we could take them on a tour of the airport and show them all the programs that we have created. And we, we've created some video projects too. We just did a, a project with John Mark, who is the choreographer for Lizzo, and Metatali, who dances with Pharrell, to try to show how space in the airport can be used for performing artists uh, we're working with Minnesota Film and TV Board so we can do more to let people know that we want to be a place for filmmakers to come and make their films there. And, you know, trying to work with the, the, the MAC and let them know you have enough money that you can let filmmakers at a certain level shoot here for free. You know, trying to get, we, we just did a huge thing uh, last year with Lula Washington Dance. They were in town to just work with the Ordway. We went sniffing around. It's like, we'd love to have you at the airport if you're coming through or leaving, you know. So they came back. They did a flash mob at the airport. And so we're constantly looking and seeking and making sure that people know arts at MSP, arts at MSP, hashtag arts at MSP. <laughs> um, we're on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And, you know, we just we want everybody to know we exist and that we are striving to be a center of creative placemaking for, this, for the state of Minnesota. So people, in a selfish way, for people to know who we are, to get rid of that term flyover, and to also be a center of arts commerce so that when people come into the city, they immediately know what's happening in the community through digital art and advertising, a combination of arts, and being able to utilize their IT in such a way that not only do they see what's happening, they can buy their tickets and go straight from the airport on the rail or by car to get there. So we want to get people to know what's going on, come back and spend more money. I want. I think you're doing a great job because that's how I feel when I'm in the airport. Thank you. Yeah. We're trying. We're working really hard, and, and you're going to see changes by 2018. There, uh, we've been able to work with the Graves brothers, and we're going to have our first uh, international hotel, so we're going to have an outdoor amphitheater at the airport in, by 2018 so people can start seeing arts in, in the southeast part of the city. We want it to be as much of a gym as downtown. We are the neighbor to everything that's happening in arts and culture in the southeast part of the city, and so we want everybody to know that we share those aspirations to making that part of the city grow more. So talking about creative placemaking and, and the popularity that's arisen from that in, in the sense of um, seeing artists and getting as, the, as a way to beautify space, right? But how can um, artists communicate their value um, beyond um, this very transactional relationship with businesses and organizations. Like, how do you um, communicate, I can just make your space, beyond like, I can just make your space um, be beautiful, because that, that 
ability to translate that is also connected mm -hmm. um, to the amount. Like there's a dollar, um, there's money assigned with your ability yeah. to, to translate that value. One of the hardest things is trying to help the airport learn how to operate with the arts community. And they're all about beautification, yeah. Mm -hmm. But they need to learn the steps of how to work with the airport, and we need to learn the steps of how to work with the arts community. So we, any project that we do in, at the airport now, we have subcommittees that are made up of people in the community as well as the people at the airport. So they start to learn a little bit more about what the, not just the aesthetic value, mm -hmm. but what the meaning behind the artwork and the artist is. I mean, they are really briefed as much as possible. I take them on field trips every fall. So people who traditionally never come downtown, uh, have never seen diverse culture, um, are starting to be acclimated to it and then understand the decisions that I'm making. Uh, and it, it makes things just flow so much better. And it, it, it keeps artists from just being that entity that brings art, makes everybody happy, and then goes away. By having artists have a voice on our music subcommittee, on our visual arts subcommittee, our film department, um, it gives them an opportunity to say, hey, you know, what you're saying here may be offensive. What you're saying here <laughs> is a needed voice. What you're saying here is that you support this, and you know, that may make them come back and say, mm, we may have to have a conversation with this about the lawyers. But they may come, they'll come back and give an answer. But it gives, the op it gives artists the opportunity to come into the airport and have a voice about what is seen and what's going out of the community representing them. Do we have, no, go, go ahead. I was just gonna say one positive trend I've seen, um, spending a lot of time in the post-production space between art and quite literally commercials, mm -hmm. is uh, young people don't watch TV. <laughs> so that classic model of, well, we just wanna take your song and put it in a commercial and you're either gonna feel good about it or not good about it and you're just gonna have that transactional mm -hmm. argue about the money. Brands are starting to make fewer and fewer television commercials. And even for the photographers and artists and fine artists in the room, we're gonna use your image for a week and it's gonna be on this billboard or in this magazine ad. Well, young people aren't looking at billboards or magazines either. And we're starting to have, uh, I'm starting to see a lot more installation-based relationships. If someone uses a song in a campaign, there's also gonna be a live component to that. Mm -hmm. There's gonna be much more focus on experience and events that are longer term where you have a much more positive relationship yeah. to actually build and collaborate mm -hmm. with a brand or an entity rather than just, here's the check, your song's going on television. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like hip hop has like mastered that. Um, the multitude of points that you can engage um, with the business. Jay, do you, I mean, for someone that you built the hiphop.com music website, like how were you able to translate? Cause I feel like, Hip hop music, in regards to working with businesses, um, particularly in the nonprofit sector, I don't think I know um, many collaborations. Um, just, can you speak to that a little bit at all? Um, yeah, I mean, that hasn't been my personal experience. I mean, obviously, hip hop has, for a very long time, been very innovative, mm -hmm. you know, going back to Run DMC doing My Adidas and then figuring out there's value for both of us. And, uh, taking advantage of that synchronicity. And, um, and I guess over the years, it's become a situation of sort of shadow product placements, like Buster Rhymes talking about past the Cavassier. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's not something I can speak to directly, but I think we've seen with, with this generation of rappers and athletes, you know, it was always, and you know, Prince was certainly um, an antecedent to this. Um, it was assumed that you were getting ripped off. Like you, you, you were the talent, and you know, some guy like Hash on the Sopranos <laughs> made you sign a contract where you were screwed for the rest of your life. But uh, you know, this generation of athletes and artists have shown you know we can be on top of both games, and uh, we can come into this knowing the leverage we have and make it work right. Let's take one more, another audience question before we get to. Oh, Felicia. Mm -hmm. um, I have a lot of questions, but this one I'd love for this panel to answer. Um, my name is Felicia Perry. I now label myself as an 
entrepreneur um, because my question is, uh, as someone who studies, trains, performs, and provides various sort of services, artwork, and things like that, so very like wide discipline from fashion designer to circus art um, is what I do and what I do professionally. I'm very much branded in this town as a fashion designer. I have yet to meet um, any sort of event or anything become involved in something that actually empowers me as a designer. It usually costs me a whole lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, and so mm. I'm at a point where I'm um, looking to rebrand. Um, but how do I do that um, and show people that I'm not just a, like, I'm everywhere just because it's there. Mm. I'm very good at just all the things that I do. Um, but be able to turn that into um, make it work for my life um, in, in like my vision. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling very stuck in this spot of having everybody think that Felicia just makes clothes and I do so many other things that um, have value, that add value to my community all right. and all kinds of things, but just finding a way to be able to do that and have it sustain me. And I'm just wondering how, is, is there a way, does anybody know, somebody want me to need my email? <laughs> <laughs> so the questions well, around. You know, I work very hard, and I'm I'm still in the hole mm -hmm. in so many areas where I'm trying to sustain myself and my family. Mm -hmm. And so I really feel like um, there's this there's there's going to be a moment where like the success of my brand is going to match my bank account, and how <laughs> do I find a way to do that? Is what I'm Chuck, can I you? I see your posts often, Felicia. Yeah. I love you, Robin Ross. I see them often. I do see how hard you work. You, you work hard. Um, and that's, you know, that's a very difficult thing when you are a multi-hybrid person. Um, and I think now it's better because I, I know Back in the day, people would look at me and tell me I wasn't serious about anything mm -hmm. because I had many passions, and I resent that. But, you know, I was lucky enough to have a good job that allowed me to pursue many of the things that I wanted to do. Um, the hard part was when I left and decided that this was going to be my focus, and it happened to be at the worst possible time in America's history. Um, I decided to start a business when the economy tanked. Uh, and it, it's an awful thing when you realize now that money's not coming in, you have a limited pool, and your manufacturer just went bankrupt. Uh, the network that you're about to make your debut on, Shopping Network, is going under. And, you know, everybody's looking at you kind of hoping to see what you're going to do next, you know, because everybody has this little joy in saying, you know, what's she going to do? And uh, it was probably one of the most difficult periods of my life because I had to really think about the pool of which I was working in. I relied on so many friends, and I know you are too. You, you rely on so many people, but it is the constant tenacity and belief in yourself that will keep you going even in the darkest moment. When, and you know, people say that, sure. I came to this state on a Greyhound bus with no job. And I wound up at Channel 9. Mm -hmm. And it's because I believed wholeheartedly that I was better than everybody else at what I did. And I was not going to let them out of my sight without them hearing about it. And really, it, it was just sweat equity and tenacity and complete faith in myself and working my networks and working my friends and giving back what I could in different areas. I don't know how many people I've paid in jewelry, but I've paid a lot of people in jewelry. And thank God for it. you know. And when one door closed, I refused to be daunted and just shift and just keep going. That door closed, you just keep going. You just keep going. And, you know... The, the jewelry is doing what I want to do because after all that, I realized I was just all over the place and I needed to have some more focus on who I was selling to and where I was selling for my own uh, uh, happiness and success. 
but uh, you really, I mean, it, it, I, I can't even begin to say, when people say, well, I worked hard and got someplace, they work so hard, mm. you would not believe it. But never give up on yourself. Never give up on yeah. anything that you want to do and that you believe in. And honestly, when things are absolutely at their roughest is when it absolutely turns around. I, I'm a big believer in faith in myself and faith in what, mm. I, what I'm representing. Because you are your brand. You would never settle for anything less. So I think you, you really have to believe it. You have to network your ass off right. in order to make that, you know, I believe in hustlers. Hustlers are important people. Mm -hmm. You know, no matter what strata of hustler you are, you got to be a hustler in this life. Nothing is given to us. Only 2% gets it. Right. We don't. So we got to really work hard and, and try to make it happen. And really, this is a great opportunity because I know who you are and I know how hard you are. Just make sure that you constantly keep things in front of me because it may not be the one thing that you told me about that I kind of pay attention to, but it might be the next thing. And I could go, oh, Felicia, you should call this person. That's how it happened. And since we've been talking about um, Prince throughout, let's talk about Prince in regards to um, his protection of his work and his protection, um, not only of his artwork, but his brand and his name and identity. Um, and now that he's gone and seeing how those things are playing out now. As an artist, especially um, an, arti an artist who's also a business person, what aspects of that, um, should artists be thinking about that early on now? Um, like thinking about how do I continue to protect my work, protect my legacy um, after my time has um, ended here on earth? Is that, is that a, a conversation or a thing artists should be thinking about right now? you guys ever talk about stuff like that? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Well, if one lesson we've all learned from Prince is I don't care how young you are as an artist or as anyone, write a will. <laughs> oh, <Right>? yes. <laughs> you know. Um, but I think, like, with, with Prince, over the years, you know, the, the world changed over the course of his musical career. And there was um, his protection of his brand and his art and his assets, that vault, um, the music. Um, it was frustrating to all of us as Prince fans that we couldn't find the things we were looking for on YouTube mm -hmm. in the digital age, right? Mm -hmm. So he was overly protective in a lot of ways and it was frustrating to a lot of us. And I think you know, one of the positives that came out of, of his death is that we're getting to see a lot of these things that we wanted to see and getting to experience mm -hmm. a much broader and deeper depth of, of his work, which is too bad that he was so overprotective of mm -hmm. that, that he didn't share that with us. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, you know, if he is up there looking down now, I, hopefully he's got a smile on his face when he's seeing the value of all of this yeah. stuff it was, that's I out was there. Just as, as a lover of his work, it was always so frustrating to me that he's so protective of it that I can't, it's so much harder for me to share his legacy. Mm -hmm. if, if I'm going to introduce young people to music, I tell them, okay, go to YouTube. I can't do that. Mm -hmm. Now mm -hmm. just in those last years, I could tell them sign on to title, but there was so long, it was like, he was protecting it so much, it was like of mice and men, he was just crushing the mass to death. We were just mm -hmm. talking over lunch that, we were talking about, like, when do you remember your first, when did you first hear of Prince? And my story was, I was in ninth grade, and I was watching Saturday Night Live, and, and Prince came on, 1981, and um, he played Party Up, and my mind was fucking blown. I was, you know, I was a ninth grader that listened to Leonard Skinner, and, and then I saw this guy. So, and then I saw, like, he's from Minneapolis, like mm -hmm. two hours away from where I live. Mm -hmm. And so just recently I was able to show that video. Like, I've been looking for that video for years. Mm -hmm. And I was able to show that video to my kids and go, this, is, this was the trans mm -hmm. transformation. Mm -hmm. This was like when life started for me was that point. It was like a movie within a movie. Right. right. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I bought his first album. He was so unusual. Mm. You know, love the falsetto. Just, it, 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 was, it wasn't until I saw Purple Rain in a movie theater. And you know that montage where they're playing Let's Go Crazy and you see the dancers and Apollonia and Prince and it's all going real fast. <laughs> You know, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> when the faces just go by so fast, I felt like I was being sucked into the screen. It's like, I'm going to be there one day. Mm. 
You know, I just had to be there. And I think half of the people who were, f were not from here had that feeling that we had to be there. Mm -hmm. This was some place that never experienced before. Even living in Chicago, Minneapolis was a mystery up the road because you didn't want to go up there, it was cold. Yeah. You weren't going up there. Do you know anybody up there? No. You know anybody black up there? No, we're not going. Why are you going up there? You know, Milwaukee, and that was it. The Dells. So it was, this, <laughs> it was just this foreign place and you had to be there because you made it seem so exciting. And the reason this town is so strong in uh, the music industry and technology really is because of Prince and the tentacles that went out from Jamie Starr and the, the time and all these people that kept the industry here and it brought people mm. here. So it made this, you know, a place that you really wanted to be and I couldn't wait to get here. You know, I hate to say it, Michael, mm -hmm. yeah, and my fiance, it was one thing, but he was from Minneapolis, I was coming here too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Scott, <laughs> what, what, in regards to Prince and, um, his identity, and, and now that we're seeing all these things unfold um, about him. I, you know, I think it, it, back to everything we've talked about, one, one thing that's very cognizant for entrepreneurs, any entrepreneur, we feel a constant pressure that if we do something, we should share it, right? This is, this is a game of self-promotion and all of those things. At the same time, an earlier panel was talking about being able to go there, being able to really dive deep and concentrate and make your art Sometimes you need privacy. Mm -hmm. And there were lots of, uh, always, rumors about Prince and, and the misidentity of Paisley as a compound. You know, but I think Andrea, if she's in here, she put it recently in a blog post best that he was just a shy guy who valued his privacy. And in terms of how do you protect yourself, how do you mm -hmm. nurture yourself, mm -hmm. sometimes it is the ability to keep people out so you can have that moment. Um, right now, my, my one print story that's front of mind is last night my family was sitting in front of CNN watching uh, Hurricane Matthew News and hoping for family and friends that they were out of harm's way. And about 10 years ago, uh, I was sitting in the kitchen at Paisley Park with Prince and we were watching CNN footage of the Bande Ache tsunami that had wiped out uh, uh, half of that, that area, and it was devastating, and we were all horrified. And Prince just picked up the phone next to him and said, we have to help. And uh, he just said a number that I know for a fact is larger than the annual salaries of all of us combined. <laughs> and then he put the phone down, donation made, walked out the door. You know, he didn't need any accolades that he had just made probably one of the single largest donations to help that community. And there's that remembrance that not everything that we do has to be a hyper share. Hyper share. Yeah. That, yeah. you know, if you can, help. And it's not always because you want the world to know, it's because you should. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Yeah, can I, wait, can I just go, 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 one go. thing building on that? That's, that's so important to me that uh, that was such a gift that Prince gave me growing up. Um, you know, I was a very introverted kid who was very isolated in a dysfunctional family, and being it, like hip hop and Prince were like my two North Stars and guiding lights, like my two spiritual parents <laughs> that didn't always get along. And, uh, <laughs> and the thing about Prince was he, like, he showed me just on a creative level, you can go into the lab and create the world that you want to live in. So he showed me that that can happen. And for someone who needed that, like he, after you create that world, other people can come and live in that world. And he saved my life by doing that. And I think that's the, what hip hop and Prince have in common. And I don't, know this is, I don't know if this is something Prince would articulate as his goal. I just know it's the effect, like showing the power of creativity to carve out community where people who don't fit in, who don't yeah. have a place at the table, can have joy and affirm their humanity. And I feel like that's, that's a theme if you look at a lot of his lyrics, like when he says, uh, before my life is done, some way, somehow, I'm gonna have fun. I'm not saying he's a political statement, but he knows everyone doesn't have an equal shot at having joy in this world. When he says, you're gonna see what, I, you're gonna see what I'm all about if I have to scream and shout, he knows that some of us have to shout a little louder yeah. for people to know that yeah. our life matters. And he created, I mean, if you've ever been, at least in New York, if you ever went to a Prince concert, it was the most diverse, loving, welcoming community experience you could have at a show. And it, uh, 
man, it just, it kills me we'll never go to a show. It's really, there's a deep sadness for me coming here for the first time, mm. and he's not here. Mm. And um, it's just like, something I took for granted as a creative person, like no matter where I am, no matter what time it is, somewhere Prince is in there plugging away <laughs> yeah. on his next thing. Like that's like part of the machinery of the universe that keeps the world spinning. So for that not to be here, it's like, and you know, it's something my, my relationship with him is from afar, so I don't mean to compare to people who are grieving in a real life way, but there's such a profound loss for all of us and I just feel like, uh, you know, that, there's different kinds of legacies. There's his assets and intellectual yep. property, but yep. there's the legacy of that world that he showed us we can create, and yep. it's on us now yep. to make that world. Amen. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Give a round of applause.